a parable of two families. First, there's the family of Linda. Her family spends time together and they play together and talk together and laugh together and learn together. They have the, the usual frictions of any normal, healthy family, but they love one another. When Linda was a child, her parents set some healthy boundaries for her behavior, and they explained the reason for those boundaries. And when Linda did something right, she was affirmed. When she did something wrong, she was lovingly corrected. She admired and respected her parents, and she knew that she always was loved, whether she succeeded or failed. The family of Linda is a family where love prevails. Then there's the family of Ruth. In her family, relationships are formal and distant. Conversations typically focus on behavior. Who's doing the right things? Who's doing the wrong things? When Ruth was a child, her parents established a variety of rules for her to follow, and she seldom was praised when she was this successful at following any of those rules, but boy, did she know it when she fell short. And she feared her parents, and she never was quite sure of their love, because she only felt accepted when she did what she was told. The family of Ruth is a family where rules prevail. Now, I'm sure we can think of families like these, but this really isn't a story about families. It's a parable. It's a parable about the kingdom of God. Which of these two families describes the way that God wants relationships to work in his kingdom? Now, based on teaching that we have from Jesus, we know that the kingdom of God is supposed to be more like the family of Linda, where love prevails. What's unfortunate, though, is that God's people sometimes lose sight of this. And when we do, we start to act more and more like the family of Ruth, where rules prevail. And this has been true throughout history. And it certainly was true for the ancient Jewish people. God chose them and he wanted them to live together in a community where they would love him and love one another. But over time they became like the family of Ruth and they viewed God as distant and fearful. And within their religion you had to follow a rigid set of religious rules to show your devotion to God. In fact, they developed 613 specific rules that you had to master if you wanted to be acceptable to God. Rules mattered more than relationship. By the time Jesus showed up in human history, people were wilting under the burden of the rules. Most normal people couldn't follow let alone even remember 613 points of the law. And out of desperation, they started asking their most influential rabbis to rank the commandments of God. The thinking was this, I, I know I can't keep all of God's laws, but if I can keep the most important ones, then maybe God won't get so mad at me. I just need to know which rules are at the top of God's list. And that's really sad when you think about it. People driven to despair by the burden of rules and just wanting some relief. People wanting to please God but feeling like it's an impossible task. People hungry for some insight that will set them free. And Jesus does exactly that. On one very foundational day, Jesus is approached by a teacher of the Jewish law. And he shows up and asks Jesus this very burning question of the day. Which commandment is the most important one? And Jesus uses this as an opportunity to remind people that the kingdom of God is intended to be like the family of Linda. A family where love prevails. 
This morning, we're going to listen in to this conversation between Jesus and this Jewish teacher and see what we can learn about love in the kingdom of God. We find this interaction in the book of Mark, chapter 12, starting in verse 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Now, this teacher of the law was a Jewish scholar. Men like this devoted themselves to the study of the Jewish Bible. And because of their deep knowledge of Scripture and their deep knowledge of Jewish tradition, they often taught in the synagogues. They were men who were respected and listened to. And as we can see, we're sort of diving into the middle of an unfolding story here. This, this teacher of the law has been listening as Jesus and some other people were debating. These other people were men from a group called the Sadducees. And they were trying to trick Jesus. They were trying to make him look bad by arguing about some arcane religious issues and doing so very insincerely. Now here's what's interesting. The teachers of the law... And the Sadducees usually don't get along. Yet both groups are united in their dislike of Jesus. There's an old saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And that typically is true at this time for the different members of the Jewish religious establishment. They may not like each other, but they like Jesus even less. And as a result, they usually take sides with each other against Jesus. But not here. Not in this case. It's clear that this teacher is not interested in taking sides. What matters to him is the truth. He is a seeker after God's truth. I think his example here is something for us to remember in our highly politicized age. Are we more interested in ensuring that our side wins? Or are we interested in getting at the truth, regardless of who says it? And this teacher likely is predisposed not to like Jesus, to not be on his side. But as he listens to this debate between Jesus and the Sadducees, he's impressed. Jesus doesn't let himself get sucked into the trick questions of the Sadducees, which shows that he is one sharp guy. And furthermore, his answer reveals some deep spiritual wisdom. And therefore, this teacher of the law thinks that Jesus is trustworthy. He's a guy with some insight, and so he asks him to rank what's the number one commandment. And for him, it's a very sincere and very relevant question. If he gets a good answer, it'll help him be a better teacher. He will be better equipped to help people as they try to navigate the very complex laws of their religion. And what we need to see, though, is this, that, that behind this question is a focus on behavior. The teacher is saying, what rule should we make the most effort to follow? What behavior should we try hardest to avoid? Is it don't murder? Don't lie? Don't steal? You see, it's really a question about how to live more effectively in a family like the family of Ruth. In a community where rules dominate. And as we're going to see, Jesus gives an unexpected answer. Instead of giving a rule, he tells the teacher that the kingdom of God is designed to be like the family of Linda, a family where love prevails. And Jesus says that because love is so much greater than rules. Look what Jesus says, verse 29. The most important one, that's the most important commandment, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And I find this answer fascinating because Jesus deliberately does not list a specific behavior. Instead, he describes a way of life. 
And he does it by taking a quote from the book of Deuteronomy about loving God. He takes another quote from the book of Leviticus about loving our neighbor and he tweaks those two Bible quotes a bit and he puts them together as one. And to this teacher of the law and anyone else listening, it would come across as something new and different. And yet it's not new, it's not different because it comes right out of the heart of the Jewish law. Jesus simply is putting the law into its proper context, into its proper place by giving a commandment of love that goes beyond just following the rules. Love God. Love others. It's really pretty simple. Yet it's not always easy to do. And in fact... If you and I place our priority on following the rules, we can find it easy not to love. Because rule followers tend to become judgmental toward other people who break the rules. That was the problem of the Pharisees that Jesus so often encountered during his life. They were prideful about their rule following ability, and they were full of criticism and contempt and judgment toward those who didn't measure up. Some of you have been in churches like that. Churches where people may have been sincere in their desire to honor God, but somehow they missed the point of Jesus' commandment of love. And yet even as I say that, I understand why people sometimes become religious rule followers. It's tempting to adopt that approach because it removes so much of the ambiguity from life. We don't have to think, we just have to do what we're told. I had a guy at our last church who would regularly say to me, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. He wanted rules. Rules, though, don't connect us with God. Rules don't deepen our connections with one another. Rules are just a duty to perform. And that's why in response to this question from the teacher, he doesn't list a specific behavior. He simply says to love. And love is so much more rewarding than just following rules. And yet it actually takes some thought to live a lifestyle of love. Because it's not always easy to determine in any given situation the best way to love. Sometimes love is very gentle. Sometimes love needs to be tough. If someone offends us, love sometimes compels us to overlook the offense and let it go. And sometimes if we're offended, love compels us to go to that other person and engage them in a conversation where we speak the truth in love so we can resolve our differences. When a family member or a friend or a stranger in need comes to us and asks for help, love sometimes means we say yes. And love sometimes means we say no. The challenge with love is that that we don't always have clear-cut, black-and-white, one-size-fits-all answers. And that's why Jesus says that love must be shaped by our connection with God. When we love God with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength, then we're going to spend time with Him through prayer and through Bible reading. And we're going to pray and say, God, I need wisdom and discernment so I know how to love. We're going to increasingly hear the voice of the Holy Spirit who will guide us so that we can think and act in ways that reflect godly love. In other words, the more time we spend with God, the more we will learn to love what he loves and who he loves. And we'll learn how to love in the way he wants us to love. And based on what Jesus says here, one of the big definitions of how we're to love is that we love others the way we love ourselves. We treat others the way we would want to be treated. And so we don't kick people when they're down. 
We don't judge each other when we fail. Instead, we help each other learn from our mistakes so we can overcome them and move forward. That's what I want. That's how I should deal with other people. Love God. Love others. That's the most important thing. And by offering this commandment of love as the top commandment, Jesus has just challenged this teacher of the law who's an expert on religious rules. He has just challenged him to adopt an entirely new outlook on life. He has turned his entire worldview upside down. It would be so easy for him to feel threatened by this insight from Jesus. It would be so easy for him to dig in his heels and resist change and remain bound by the traditions of his culture and his religion. And as we think about what Jesus has said and who this man is, it's fair to wonder, is he going to be able to see it? Is he going to be able to see that this commandment actually reflects the heart of God? How will this teacher of the law respond to a commandment of love. Let's take a look. Verse 32. Well said, teacher, the man replied. Now, now that's a really lame translation. It's accurate, but it misses the emotion and the passion behind what this man says. And it comes through in the original language. It's as if he says, oh, teacher, what a beautiful answer. He is overjoyed with what Jesus has said. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but Him. To love Him with all your heart, with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. This teacher is so enthusiastic as he endorses and affirms this commandment of love. He understands that love is far greater than religious rules and it's far greater than the rituals of religious life. He understands that this is a commandment that actually sets people free. And just as Jesus, by offering this commandment of love, has challenged this man to rethink his worldview, what this man now says about burnt offerings and sacrifices is almost revolutionary. These things lie at the very heart of the Jewish religion because these are the practices by which people can be forgiven for their sins. And yet the teacher understands that they're meaningless. They're meaningless. Unless we love God and love others. In essence, I think this is what the teacher, he's saying. He's saying, I know I can't offer my sacrifice at the altar as a sign of my devotion to God and then go out and knowingly mistreat other people. If I do, then my request for forgiveness is insincere. Without love, my offering is just an empty religious ritual. And as I think here about what this teacher of the law says to Jesus, I think his response also applies to us. Because in the same way, we can't show up here at church and sing praises to God and honor the sacrifice of Jesus through communion and then go out and thoughtlessly engage in dishonesty or gossip or any other behavior that's unloving toward other people. Because without love, what we do here is just A religious practice. Without love, we're just attending church. But when we love God, and we love others, then coming together as the people of God to worship can be transforming. We come because we love God. We come because we're committed to one another as the family of God, and we come out of our love for God. And as we worship together and experience the presence of God, then we enter into this cycle where our love for God and for one another grows. And worship truly becomes transforming. And we become equipped to love in the way God wants us to love. 
Love is so much greater than religion. And love is so much greater than rules. That's what Jesus teaches us here through this commandment of love. And that's what this teacher of the law grasps. It's clear that this man understands the heart of God. So Jesus commends him. And Jesus points him toward the kingdom of God. After the man speaks, verse 34, when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. That response kind of shut the crowd up for a moment. You know, we're products of a very individualized Western culture. And as a result, we tend to see the world through very personal eyes. And this means that we sometimes emphasize only the personal salvation aspects of the message of Jesus. And it means that sometimes we overlook the implication of what he teaches us about the kingdom of God. Yet for Jesus, the goal was, the goal always is, to draw people into his kingdom. Jesus began his public ministry by announcing the kingdom. He said, the time has come and the kingdom of God is near. This is the good news. News of the kingdom. When we read the parables of Jesus, many of them begin with these words. The kingdom of God is like. Because Jesus wants people to understand how life is supposed to work in the kingdom of God. And here he affirms this teacher of the law with kingdom language. He doesn't tell him, oh, because you understand this commandment of love, you're now a step closer to personal salvation. He says, because you understand this commandment of love, you're not far from the kingdom of God. God's desire is that every person will become a citizen in his kingdom. And it's about more than just me. It's about us. It's about, more, it's about more than being transformed as individuals. It's about God transforming his world as he brings about his kingdom. And that's why love is so critical. Because love enables us to get beyond ourselves. Love is what enables us to get connected to God. And as we get connected to God, then he teaches us and shows us and encourages us so we can love others in appropriate ways. And as we more and more learn to love others as Jesus loves, then we make a difference in the world. And we help to bring about the kingdom of God. And this teacher of the law gets it. He understands this essential truth. So Jesus says, you're close to the kingdom of God. You're on the way. Keep going. Keep pursuing and expressing God's love. Discern how you can love God and love others in the midst of the daily situations of life. Because that's how you head toward the kingdom. And this kingdom is not far off. The kingdom is near. Kingdom of God is near. And I believe that Jesus is telling us that the more we love the way he wants us to love, the closer we all get to the kingdom. And here's what's really amazing. If this teacher of the law truly embraces what Jesus has said, then not only will he become part of the kingdom of God, he'll help to bring about the kingdom of God. As he allows his life to be shaped by godly love, he will help people experience the love of God here and now in this world, in this life. This is the kingdom that Jesus announced, the kingdom that God wants to bring about on earth as it is in heaven. And we will not experience it fully in this life, but we can make it an increasing reality when we make the choice to live not like the family of Ruth where rules prevail, but instead to live like the family of Linda, where love prevails, because the greatest command is love. I remember when my dad taught me how to ride a bike. He spent a lot of time running alongside my bike, helping me learn to balance, getting ready to catch me in case I should fall, 
which I often did. And of course, in learning to ride a bike, I made a lot of mistakes. We all do. Doesn't seem to be something that comes naturally to most people. But when I messed up, my dad never chewed me out. Instead, he patiently explained what I did wrong. He got me back on the bike, and I tried again. My dad gave me instructions. He gave me encouragement. And he gave me reassurance simply by being with me. Now, sometimes when I was out there in the street on our cul-de-sac, riding around, getting my riding lessons, my neighbor buddy Mike was also out in the street getting his riding lessons. His dad, unfortunately, approached things a little differently. He wasn't with his son. He sat in a chair on the sidewalk and bellowed instructions. And when Mike would goof up and make a mistake, his dad would yell things like, And I'm paying attention! Listen to me! Once Mike took a bad fall and started to cry, and his dad just sat there and yelled, don't be such a baby. I didn't know how to process all that as a kid, but as an adult, I've reflected back on that. And it's interesting because both dads wanted their sons to learn the rules for riding a bike. And we all know there's rules. There's skills we have to master. We know how to have to learn how to keep our balance and how to steer and how to pedal and how to brake. For Mike's dad, though, that's all that mattered. The rules prevailed. And in that moment, he taught his son how to live like the family of Ruth. And thankfully, my dad understood that mastering the rules was only part of the picture. Teaching me how to ride a bike was a way for him to express his love. So yes, I learned the rules. Yes, I mastered the skills. But I did them within the context of love. My dad loved me. And I loved him. And in that moment, he taught me how to live like the family of Linda. You see, in that situation, my dad was a role model for what love could be like, for what love should be like within the kingdom of God. And that's what Jesus wants. That's why he gives us this commandment of love. He gives it because it affects all of life. And I believe this commandment challenges us to examine ourselves. I believe this commandment challenges us to see if we really take Jesus at his word. Do you and I really believe that love is the greatest commandment? In every situation, of life. Here's a way to test whether or not we truly take Jesus at his word. What's our default response? When I encounter a situation, when I encounter another person, do I immediately think, what's the right rule to follow? Or do I immediately think, what's the best way to love? Because of this conversation between a teacher of the law and Jesus, We know how Jesus wants us to answer that. Love God. Love others. That's the foundation for life in the kingdom of God.